Whoa, Nate, you made the Pro Tour again? <laughs> yeah, are you surprised? Uh, no, I just didn't know you were a serious player. I'm not. I just accidentally won another qualifier. Half the field had to drop after round three because they had to go play in a youth soccer game. How the heck am I supposed to compete in a pro tour? I mean, how do you stay sharp against so many great opponents round after round? Well, you have to be versatile. Don't play every match the same way. For any given opponent, you must transform into a player that defeats them. Transform. For any given opponent, you must transform into a player that defeats them. Ruins, reveal swamp, pitch youths, flip air, pay madness, combat. So yeah, I flew to the Albuquerque PTQ because I thought it'd be the best value, especially given the nearby burrito stand. Swing, take seven, you're a two, past turn. Psh, Aether Grid plus Tamiyo's journal, so tight. I mean, I might be the only one who brought this tech, but by Sunday, I won't be the only one who wished they had. Vampires, attack! Bink, just two damage. <laughs> What's up with Olivia's sword? It's like a double sword, but it totally looks like it would break if it hit a rock or something. Unless the middle part is made out of invisible metal. Oh my god, that would be so cool! It's an efficient card in a vacuum, but its best advantage is its toughness. 6% higher than the mean on creatures at the same mana cost, based on adjusted historical averages. Weighted, of course, for the new format and its place in the color pie. You don't scare me. I tore apart the buttresses and balustrades of Markov Manor like a dissected animal. Question. Yes? What's your record? 0 and 5. Okay. Question. Yeah? Why does everyone at this Pro Tour have a mustache? Paul Chion's a friend of mine. He told everyone you lose to players with mustaches. Three hundred and seventy-eight of the world's best magic players have gathered here in Madrid to compete in Pro Tour Shadows of Arinistrad. They all come as contenders, but only one will transform into a Pro Tour champion. Unless that player already won a Pro Tour, in which case they don't transform, they augment? Or, no wait, if a Pro Tour champion wins two Pro Tours in one turn, then they transform back into a normal player. That doesn't make sense. Uh, whatever, you know what I'm trying to say. In any case, Shadows over Innistrad is a long-awaited set for Magic fans, and one reason for that is Innistrad's popular double-faced cards, a true novelty for collectors and gamers alike. So I'm here with Mark Gottlieb, who is the lead designer of Shadows Over Innistrad. It's a big hit set, and one of the hallmarks of the set are these double face cards uh, that transform. So these cards, they present a lot of logistical hurdles. Why do double face cards? What's the upside? There's more card per card. Each card has two names, two art boxes, two arts, two text boxes. So flavorfully, you get to tell a story. You get to tell two beats of a story. It was this, and then this happened, and then now it's this. So uh, it's, it really makes the game come alive. From a mechanical standpoint, the cards can do so much more rather than just, okay, and it gets a little bigger. It gets bigger temporarily. You can put some plus one, plus one counters on it, whatever. Now it can be a whole different card. It can be a different color. You can change the power and toughness more radically. It can gain abilities. It can lose abilities. It can change entire card types. There's so much freedom. There's so much freedom to tell a story, so much freedom in the gameplay. So, Jerry, 
the cards here at the Pro Tour are sleeved for the draft, but that's not the case at home or at your local game store. So how do double face cards change the process of drafting? So it, drafting is normally like this, this hidden information process, right? Like you don't know what the neighbors to your left and right are trying to draft. You just have to use your, your best guess, basically. And with the double face cards, sometimes you get a, a peek into that. You know, like if, if they're first picking a, a white double face card, you're like, okay, this guy wants to draft white and maybe I should stay out of his way, right? Uh, so then you get kind of some extra information and you can use that to your advantage. So uh, if, if the person to your left takes a, a red double face card and then you get a pack with like, a close pick, maybe a red and blue card, you're like, well, maybe I should just take this blue card because then I won't be fighting my neighbor for that color. Fans of the Pro Tour can tell you a lot about its players. What decks they play, how many top eights they have, what strategy articles they've written. But how much do they really know them? Up next, we ask Magic players some completely normal and extremely mundane questions in a segment we call Getting to Know You. So Rich, when did you start playing Magic? Uh, about 20 years ago? I was 11, I'm 30 now, so close to 20 years ago. I started playing Magic a little bit in high school, um, and it was mainly just decks other friends had had. Um, I didn't start playing competitively until about 2012, and that's actually when I ended up getting my DCI. When I was 11, like in sixth grade, it was uh, September, uh, September 1994. Shifting gears a little bit, um, what did you think about Mrs. Warren blaming the rise of werewolves on Lady Evelyn's shoddy amulets? I have no idea what you're talking about. What did you think about Mrs. Warren blaming the rise of werewolves on Lady Evelyn's shoddy amulets? Oh my gosh. What did you think about Mrs. Warren blaming the rise of werewolves on Lady Evelyn's shoddy amulets? I don't have the slightest clue what you're talking about. I actually don't know much about that. I try to keep up every once in a while with the, with the lore, but it's been so crazy. Um, I haven't gotten to sit down and actually get all of the information. <laughs> well, this is an easier one, follow up. Uh, I mean, what did you think about Mia's response to Wilbur when Wilbur said, you're not a true slayer, and then Mia was like, well, you're not a fisherman. <laughs> what did you think about Mia's response to Wilbur accusing her of not being a true slayer? Is you know, Animal Farm or Babe Pig in the City? Or are we still talking about magic? You don't know anything about Shadows of Ernestrad? Um, well, I know about Fiery Temper, and uh, I know about uh, Deadweight, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Yes, baby. Well, Brad, it's been since 2010 when you won Player of the Year that you last top eight at a Pro Tour, and you're back again. What have these last five and a half, six years been like for you and your road back to the top? Uh, it's been rough, honestly. Like it's been, uh, it's been interesting in the sense that like I got to experience pretty much everything in Magic besides winning a Pro Tour. Like the highs, the extreme lows, the getting my game back, uh, thinking that I just want to go into commentary because I don't think I have my game anymore and, and I started streaming and then I finally just gave up on that and said I want to try to beat the best at, at the game and I used to build all these weird decks to attack metagames because I thought that that was my way of beating the better players and I just spent I mean the last three years as a student of the game trying to get back to this spot. I've experienced so much failure at the Pro Tour that uh, it, it's hard to not just have this like unbelievable sense of happiness right now.
Pro Tour Shadows of Arinistrad featured one of the greatest top eights in Pro Tour history. With three Hall of Famers and the reigning world champion, the competition couldn't be tougher. Also present was one member of Italy's World Magic Cup winning team. Andrea Mengucci kicked off his top eight by battling John Finkel, arguably the greatest magic player of all time. Playing in his mind-boggling 16th top eight, Finkel had superior experience from seasons past. But Mengucci had Nissa, Vastwood Seer, her friend with two swords, and this fish lizard thing. With company like that, Mengucci defeated the Hall of Famer and advanced to the semis, where he met another Hall of Famer. Shota Yasuoka showed up to the fight with dragons, and they battled with Mengucci's motley crew of creatures to split games one through four in the series. But the dragons were nowhere to be found in game five. Instead, Yasuoka got beaten down by a masked elf holding a glowing voodoo doll. And thus, Andrea Mengucci advanced to the finals. You could be forgiven for not recognizing Pittsburgh native and high school ultimate frisbee coach Steve Rubin. He may not be as renowned as his Sunday competition at Pro Tour Shadows of Arinistrad, but players in the know will tell you he is the real deal. He earned a seat at last year's World Championship, and that's one of the hardest things to do in Magic. In the quarterfinals, Rubin played against former Player of the Year Brad Nelson. Aided by the Archangel Avison, Rubin's world didn't break in the face of Nelson's monstrous Eldrazi. In the semifinals, Rubin had the incredibly easy task of battling the reigning world champion, Seth Manfield. Actually, not so easy. After a knockdown dragout series that went the full five games, Rubin deployed an army of little flying robots to defeat the champ and propel himself to the finals. And so the Pro Tour would come down to two young superstars in the making on their finest Sunday to date. Game one of the finals went to Steve Rubin on the backs of a troop of warriors. He took game two in more spectacular fashion, soliciting the services of Avacyn, the Purifier, and Ormondal, the demonic, profane prince. And while Mengucci and his collected company of creatures fought to win game three, Rubin struck back in game four with an immense army powered by Nyssa, voice of Zendikar. The blows were too hard for Mengucci to handle, and so he extended his hand to congratulate Steve Rubin as the champion of Pro Tour Shadows of Arinistrad. That was a really intense match. Uh, what, you know, what, what was going through your mind during that match? Um, I was just trying to keep my head straight and make, make solid plays. I mean, it was, it's obviously a very difficult matchup, very, very confusing, and I think uh, I just tried to kill him, basically. I mean, it sounds, it sounds pretty absurd, but that basically was my plan in the last game anyway. So. What is it about that intense competition that attracts you so much? Well, there's just something about playing Magic against the best players in the game that really, really makes it, makes it fun for me, you know, like as a person that's been playing Magic all my life, you know. I've been through the PTQs, I've been through the pre-releases, I've gone all the way up, so I just love playing at the uh, best competition, basically. I see your teammates lining up to congratulate you, and let me do the same. Congratulations to Steve Rubin, the champion of Pro Tour Shadows of Arinistrad. So that just pinches the middle of your nose, your septum. Okay. Oh, I'm supposed to wear this? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that feels really weird. It does. All right. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Which one would you prefer? Okay, okay. And go. <laughs> okay, okay. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that was really fake. Hold on, let's try that again.